that have been able to uh, join in today. Uh, my name is Mike Bennett. I'm the National CIG uh, Program Manager and just wanted to spend a little bit of time with you today to talk about the fiscal year 2016 uh, CIG announcement for program funding. And first, I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, I know it's valuable, so we'll try to keep on script and let you go at, at the designated end time. I uh, have my contact information at the end, so if you don't, if you have questions and weren't able to get them answered, or wanted to touch bases with me uh, outside of the webinar, uh, please feel free to either email or call, and I'll get back to you as as soon as I can. Again, uh, thanks for your time. Okay, the announcement for program funding for 2016 was released. I guess about two and a half, about three and a half weeks ago. So we're about into week four of uh, folks uh, having the opportunity to uh, get their proposals together. We've got two locations where that's posted, and that one is grants.gov. And the easiest way, and what I usually do when I go to grants.gov, uh, I just type a search for CIG, and it usually uh, pops up. Uh, the other location is our CIG website, and I've got that link on the slide as well. And if you don't have access to either of those, you can uh, give me a call or send me an email, and I will go ahead and send you a copy uh, directly. Uh, a little bit about some of the background of CIG, uh, authorized under the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, and it, it goes back to, uh, I guess, 1985. But basically, the first CIGs uh, were awarded out of the 2002 uh, Farm Bill. Uh, that was kind of the, the overall guidance with the first CIGs coming about in 2004. Uh, CIG in general, it's a voluntary competitive program, and, and it is very highly competitive. Uh, last year, we had about 400 applications, and we're able to uh, award about 45 grants. The, the general purpose is to stimulate the development and adaption of innovative conservation approaches and technologies, and it's to leverage federal investment environmental enhancement and protection in conjunction with agricultural protection. Uh, purpose, again, is to demonstrate potentially innovative technology and or approaches. So it doesn't necessarily just result in a piece of equipment. It's uh, also uh, a mindset change, uh, cultural, uh, behavioral changes, and that's some of the approaches. Uh, typically does not fund research with the exception of on-farm research. When I was first looking at doing the webinar, uh, one of the recommendations I had was to kind of highlight a couple successes uh, for a lot of folks that, that may have applied in the past or are thinking about applying. Uh, if you haven't been awarded a grant and haven't uh, seen firsthand the benefits, uh, a couple successes may may uh, cause some thought-provoking ideas and, and, helpful, and hopefully uh, let folks know that, that it's just not a theoretical uh, program, that it actually does uh, yield results. So the first one I just wanted to highlight was, uh, and this is a, a project that's been ongoing for a couple of years. It's been highly successful, and it's dealing with solar-powered irrigation uh, pumping. For many sites, if, if they're not near an electrical grid, you have to haul in diesel fuel and run generators uh, to run your irrigation equipment, and sometimes that just becomes uh, cost prohibitive to do. W with this grant, it was to conduct a, basically a pilot project to look at the feasibility of solar energy to help run uh, pumping irrigation systems. And it was initially, uh, encourage and facilitate the adaption of systems among Navajo and other tribal conservation districts. The, uh, it was a solar array, and I've got a picture of what that looks like. It was uh, completed in August of 2013 uh, following completion. 
they were able to run the system uh, about a 15 horsepower well pump for irrigation. They were able to run it six, roughly six hours a day to help uh, pump water. Just a, a picture of what it looks like coming out of the, the uh, well and just a picture of what the solar array uh, looks like in this case. That's uh, one example. It's, it's been highly successful. It's, it's uh, showed up in our one of our top ten highlighted projects. The chief of NRCS often uh, identifies this project as a success as well when he's talking about the CIG program. Another success along the same line using solar uh, powered systems this one is a uh, primarily for uh, beginning farmers is where it started out at and what they looked at was solar power for re refrigeration type systems uh, technology was created by NASA and then re-engineered to use it for agricultural operations so in this case they used it for a couple of different uh, purposes uh, for storage containers to help keep them cold the products cold so they didn't spoil they also used it for drip irrigation and also provided energy for lighting when necessary uh, again another uh, successful program and this gives you an idea of what that system uh, looks like I don't have any pictures of it on the ground so they're just a, a couple successes that that we've gleaned so it, it does work, uh, it does yield some, some good positive benefits that are adaptable and scalable to any number of uh, farmers, ranchers, or foresters. Uh, kind of shifting a little bit, some of the eligibility uh, under the CIG, the EQIP funds, uh, again, mm -hmm. used to award competitive grants uh, for non-federal organizations non-governmental organizations, uh, federally recognized Indian tribes, and other Native American tribal organizations, as well as individuals. So it, it covers a broad spectrum uh, of different types of organizations, uh, small businesses, large businesses. Pretty much if it's not federal government, uh, CIGs can be awarded. So again, very broad. Eligibility again, it's... Uh, from all from all the 50 United States will accept applications as well as the Caribbean area, the Pacific Island area, and the District of Columbia. The one key caveat is for CIG, the, the project must involve producers who meet the EQIP uh, program re eligibility requirements. And I've got another slide. I'll talk a little bit about that. And that doesn't necessarily mean you've got to involve farmers on the ground. It, it, it has to involve producers in that category in one way or another. Uh, sometimes it's simply through out, outreach type projects. The participating producers aren't required to have an equip contract. So that makes it, it much easier for a lot of folks. EQIP, uh, as far as the eligibility under EQIP, we primarily look at four different uh, categories. And one is just in compliance, or four different eligibility requirements. One is to be in compliance with the highly erodible land and wetland conservation compliance provisions. Need to be an agricultural producer and have control of the land for the term of the proposed uh, period. And usually the grants are up to three years. And then the applicant or the equip eligible producer has to be in compliance with the adjusted gross income requirements. There is a matching fund component to CIG, and that's 50% of the entire project must be cost shared. So for every federal dollar provided, there is a uh, non-federal uh, dollar match. And this can be in either cash or it can be in-kind uh, resources, in-kind services. And a change over the last couple of years is that in-kind used to be limited 
has a certain percentage, but with the last change in the regulation, there is no limit. So in-kind can be a, a, a significant part of the project. So if you've got folks that, that volunteer their time, that can be costed out, that can be considered uh, a match, uh, donated property, uh, and equipment, donated land. So all that could be in-kind and all that would contribute towards that match. For 2016, uh, the, the chief is making $20 million available to support uh, conservation innovation grants. The maximum award for this year was increased from $1 million to $2 million. And again, it can be for a single year or multi-year project not to exceed three years. Each year within our announcement, we kind of list the general categories of consideration. Our first category for this year is the historically underserved producers, veteran farmers, or ranchers and organizations comprised of or representing these individuals or entities. And we have 10%, up to 10% is set aside for this uh, particular category. So $2 million is set aside for uh, this area. Uh, the other primary focus area is those projects that would improve or protect ground or surface water quality. And a third category, a fairly new concept, is in conservation finance. So by this, ca this category, again, it's fairly new concept, but basically you're looking for private investment dollars to, uh, that can be leveraged to help improve conservation efforts. So sim similar along the line of uh, carbon credit trading, uh, water quality trading, uh, wetland type trading, things along that line. And there are some green type companies that will set up uh, programs where they can make a modest uh, return on their investment. This is a slide we used in a previous webinar. It didn't come out so well when it was converted this time. But, uh, but basically what I wanted to try to do was just kind of show the progression of uh, the program. But once they application or proposal is submitted. Uh, we review that in our office. We'll put it into the various categories. Uh, from there, uh, we have a group of, we'll establish a panel of subject matter experts who will review the individual proposals and kind of provide their assessment. Following that, it goes to another level, uh, Grants Review Board, which is comprised of senior leadership within NRCS who will take the recommendations from the grant or from the subject matter experts, consider all the projects that were submitted. Uh, they will identify uh, a selected number uh, to the chief of NRCS for eventual uh, approval and grant award. Uh, last year we started out with about 400 applications or proposals and we were able to award 45 grants at the end. So it's a very competitive process. And this process in general takes about two to three months. So I guess closer to three months from the time we receive the proposals until the time the announcement is made as far as the actual winners. Uh, some of the information that, that is required to make a proposal. And if, if you go back to the announcement for program funding, it lists all this information in, in much greater detail. The initial part is just kind of the application form, a standard form. Uh, second part, project executive summary. And this is really key because when we get in front of the grants review board and in front of the chief, uh, this executive summary is, is in general what, what we show to the board and to the chief when we try to uh, explain a project. 
So the more concise, more accurate this can be, uh, it, it really helps out because we would rather use the grantee's word when we're, words when we're presenting in front of the chief uh, versus trying to go through the project description and trying to pull out that key information. So better off that can be, uh, the more successful it will be as it, as it works its way through the various processes. Uh, project description, and that's outlined in detail, more of what we need for that. There also is a general assessment of, of the environmental impacts. Uh, we don't need a full environmental assessment or full consultation to take place, but we need to have some assurance or have some idea of, of the level of environmental work or mitigation that might have to take place uh, or the potential for any consultation that might be required. So is that, if that's up, identified up front, it really uh, helps as we move forward. Uh, budget information, uh, there's a significant section on that Basically, uh, the applicant needs to outline their budget to include the, the c different categories for the federal share, plus where the matching dollars are coming from, and if there are any indirect costs, they need to be identified as well. Uh, letters of support uh, will help strengthen the application, uh, as well as if the applicant uh, has had previous CIG projects uh, to kind of identify them. It's not necessarily mean that they will be given preferential treatment, but it, it gives us some idea on the level of success they may have had uh, in the past. So if, if you haven't had the opportunity to uh, be awarded a CIG, uh, that's not to say that you won't have the opportunity in the future. Declaration of Historically Underserved and Veterans Farmers, and again, this is a, it's a self-declaration. Uh, we don't need any supporting information, so it's just uh, you self-declare if you're in that category. And then we also need to have documentation of submission to the state conservationists, and that helps as we go through our reviews. Uh, at the state level, they're the folks that are on the ground and have a much better idea of what is going on. Uh, in some cases, they've worked hand in hand with the potential applicant, so so their input is really critical uh, going forward. Okay, one of the things uh, to consider as you're putting your package together uh, for consideration is look at NRCS as as a as a customer. I mean, what is your innovative technology or approach that you're trying to uh, identify or accomplish through the project. Uh, transferability is the key. The, the end result of a project is to have a, to have a product that can be transferred to others. Uh, maybe within that particular region, could be within a state uh, area or potentially nationwide. But in general, what we're looking for is something that can be transferred. Uh, what benefits does the project provide to agricultural producers that, that may partner with NRCS? Uh, the project the proposal itself should identify clear deliverables. Uh, sometimes we get proposals in where we it's hard to really tell what the applicant is attempting to accomplish, so it makes it really hard as we're trying to evaluate that uh, particular proposal. So clear deliverables help, and in the end, uh, a, a product that is that is usable by by NRCS uh, and that can again be be exported. Uh, uh, early key is to start early and plan to submit early. It, in the past, uh, there have been challenges with the various websites. Uh, and if there are, we'll certainly keep things open a little bit longer, but the earlier that a proposal can be submitted, uh, the better off you will be. And, w and once submitted through grants.gov, uh, you should get an immediate uh, feedback on that, saying it was submitted successfully. And we will, within the CIG office, uh, for those proposals or for the proposals that are submitted to the CIG uh, intake email box, we will get an acknowledgement out uh, within 10 days is what we're going to strive for. OK, 
Okay, just wanted to shift a little bit and cover our CIG webpage. Uh, we've got a, a, quite a few resources on there. Uh, we're trying to make improvements every day uh, as we move forward and hear from other folks as to those things that may be helpful as they move forward. Uh, CIG webpage, uh, we've listed the, the link down towards the bottom. And over here is really uh, a lot of good information for prospective applicants, uh, which is key and, and should help. Uh, on this page, if you hit the prospective applicants page, and uh, here's a direct link over here to that page. Uh, we've tried to put different examples of project descriptions, uh, a couple different ones with these icons you can click. Uh, we've got a couple different budget examples. Over the years, we've collected a, a number of frequently asked questions. We've tried to post them. We held a webinar a couple weeks ago, well, I guess last Monday, uh, the 24th, uh, that is posted. This is an older slide, but the uh, previous webinar is posted. Uh, we're working on the questions and answers, and they should be posted by tomorrow, uh, resulting from the last webinar. Uh, should be on there. And we've got some other, other links, uh, application forms. Uh, if you wanted to look at individual application forms before going into grants.gov, uh, there's a, a link there and some other uh, federal sites that could be uh, helpful moving forward. And our contact information is at the bottom as well. The, as far as how to submit, uh, there's two different uh, submissions we are asking. Uh, one is through grants.gov, and this is the CIG announcement in grants.gov, or you can uh, simply go to the top of the grants.gov, I believe it's upper right, uh, type in CIG, and there should be a direct link that's provided as well. So this needs to be, uh, this is the official submission through grants.gov. Uh, what we are also asking is a PDF copy uh, also sent to the CIG email intake box. And if you can, when you're submitting to that box, uh, if you can title your submission just FY16 CIG application submission and the entity name, your name that it's going to be submitted under, uh, that will, will really help. Uh, what we found with grants.gov is, is we sometimes get 15 to 20, 25 different individual pages submitted through grants.gov and have to piece everything together. And undoubtedly, when you do something like that, uh, occasionally something will be left off and that something may be critical. So we, in order to try to eliminate that, we're also asking that copy, a copy of the complete package be sent to the CIG email box, and that way we can compare the both to make sure that we don't miss anything. Uh, asking folks not to submit paper copies. Uh, sometimes they take a significant amount of time to reach our office. And uh, I've been in other federal organizations where sometimes it might take three to four weeks uh, to get something through the mail before, because of all the different screening. So we try to do as much uh, work as possible through electronic means. Uh, they generally make it to our office uh, pretty quick. And grants.gov should give you feedback right away when it's submitted. Uh, CIG email inbox, uh, we're going to strive to get uh, acknowledgement of your submission to you within 10 business days is what we're going to strive for. Uh, if you have submitted something through the CIG email box, and you haven't heard anything within the 10 business days, please let us know. Uh, that way we can do the research and make sure that the submission was received. Uh, proposal deadline for this year is May 10th, uh, 2016. Uh, 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern time is, is when we're, we're shooting for. 
Now, if you are familiar with past uh, CIG announcements, uh, you've probably seen a pre-proposal and a proposal, uh, two separate dates. Uh, this year we are not doing a pre-proposal submission. When we looked at the past years, what we found was most uh, submissions that we received during the pre-proposal phase were, were, were great, great ideas, great concepts. Uh, high likelihood of success, so most folks were invited to uh, submit a full proposal. And any time you've worked on a project, you've stopped and have to start back up five to six weeks later, you lose some of that, that continuity uh, and that creative thinking. So with this year, because it, it really screened out few proposals, uh, it created a lot of extra work, I think, for the applicant and also for the NRCS. We've just gone to one 60-day uh, open period and are requesting the full proposals uh, at the end of that period. Uh, contact information, again, I'm uh, Mike Bennett, the National CIG Program Manager. Uh, my phone and email, if you've got questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, Melanie Cot Cotton is in our office. Uh, she can also help as well. And then on the grant side, Frankie Comfort is uh, the administrative contact if you've got issues uh, on grants.gov or administrative type issues. But don't hesitate to reach out to me. I, I typically field uh, a couple dozen calls or emails uh, just about every day since the announcement had gone out. And with that, I think we've got some uh, some time for questions of me, and then we're going to break. And uh, Eric Giles uh, also has a presentation that he wanted to uh, show as well and, and discuss. So again, if if you got any questions uh, that may be of interest to the to the group, uh, I can entertain them. If you'd rather wait and uh, contact me either by phone or email, uh, that is perfectly fine as well. Oh, well, Mike, uh, I've got a question. Go ahead. You want to go first, Dan, or you want me to? Go for it. This is um, Katherine Menthorn. I'm with the uh, Teachum Conservation District with the Confederated Tribes, the Umatilla Indian Reservation. I also uh, work for Intertribal Agriculture Council, but the Teachum Conservation District Board is present here. We've been looking at uh, some irrigation projects, and early on in your presentation, you were talking about the uh, solar-powered irrigation. Do you have any uh, examples we could look at? I mean, the, the, pa the actual paperwork on them. I would have to check and see what we have available. Uh, I know within our website we have, uh, there is a project search tool that may have some of that information, but I'd have to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, if you can uh, send me a message with your direct contact information, uh, I can work one-on-one -on -one with you to get some, uh, some hard examples. Okay, I'll do that. Okay. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Um, I had a question. Um, so are tribes eligible to apply themselves directly? Yeah, yes. Okay, great. Following Any up other on questions? The and would the would the tribal conservation be distri district be eligible as well? From my understanding, yes, they they would be. But let me confirm that. Uh, and, and are you going to have the opportunity to to uh, or will I have the opportunity to send you some questions and answers, Dan, that can be posted with the slides or? How can we get some of that information out? Um, yeah, I think there's a couple of different strategies.
that session that we that we can post 